All right, my name is Dan Blewett, and uh, on the official layout, you'll see a slightly different title, but my talk today is called The Black Swan. Uh, I'm a former professional baseball player, and what I want to talk about today is the mental side of the game, which is often unseen, it's difficult to measure, but it has very, very tangible results. So again, as you watch a baseball game, this is one of the new ways we can sort of distill everything that we see. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on in our heads that many of you will never be privy to that hopefully we can find a way to measure in the future. So in 2016, I was playing for a team called the Long Island Ducks. It's a different uniform. And we are on a seven day road trip heading down to York, Pennsylvania. And when we got to York, we had, on a Tuesday, a Johnny Holstaff day. So if you don't know what Johnny Holstaff is, that's when all the bullpen pitchers pitch the whole game. You know, today we have openers and all these different methods. But uh, we are down a starter, so we had a Johnny Holstaff day. So in the fourth, uh, one of my good friends actually got into a jam and loaded the bases with nobody out. I got the call, and I was quickly on the hill trying to put out uh, kind of a big fire in the middle of the game. So... I was going to face the three, four, and five hitters who together, even though it was only June, had about 40 home runs between them. The first guy was 6'5", the second guy was a little shorter but had the most power of the three, and the fifth hitter, a lot less imposing, still had hit about 12 jacks to that point in the season. So as I got up there and I committed to my first pitch, I fired in a fastball right by the guy for strike one. After that, it was business as usual, pop, pop, pop and I had a strikeout. So I had one out in my bases loaded jam, and I was quickly just a ground ball away from getting out of it. Now, I was a fly ball pitcher. Um, I never had data taken, but I was probably a high spin rate pitcher. And so I knew a ground ball wasn't likely gonna come. Nonetheless, I refocused and bop, 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 punched out the next hitter on four fastballs. So now, here I am with two outs. I've done most of the hard work. And I have a chance to get out of this bases loaded jam, which is an extremely difficult situation to sort of climb out of. Um, yet, the next two things that happened were sort of unbelievable. Rather than capitalize on my momentum, I fell behind. Ball one to the next hitter. This is the five hitter, the guy who I was over the hump. This guy wasn't the one that I was really fearing when I thought about my game today. Then ball two, then ball three. I caught up with a strike and I walked him. And so out there on the mound, you wouldn't have seen me do this. I was a, a robot, I was very stoic, I was very in control of my emotions, but inside, I was thinking the same thing everyone else was, which is you just punched out the two best hitters in the lineup and then you walked this guy. So the next hitter comes up, ball one, ball two, ball three. I catch up with the sort of obligatory strike and I walked him too. So after two dramatic strikeouts, coming in like this dominant, aggressive fireman, I walked in two runs. And again, on the mound, you would have seen me just refocus, ready to pitch. But inside, I couldn't have been more angry, frustrated, and really just furious with myself. I didn't know what was happening. It was a really big ball of emotions that, again, the fans weren't privy to, my opponents weren't privy to, my coaches weren't privy to. But I was just, the steam would have been rocketing into the sky out of my ears. So the next hitter I knew, I'd played with him the previous season, we were teammates. He was a guy who, if you got ahead, you could easily bury him with a breaking ball. So I get ahead with a fastball, he fouls it off. I throw another fastball, I throw it by him. And so I stick with the fastball. He's having a tough time catching up. After four fastballs, it's still 0-2, so I decide it's finally time to switch pitches and let's bury him, let's bury that breaking ball and put him away. As the pitch rolled out of my hand, it kind of popped up, which is what bad curveballs do, and it gently coasted towards the plate before it was met with a crash, and he sent a bases clearing double into the right center gap. So after two strikeouts, I walked in two runs, and then for good measure, cleared all the other three off the base paths. So the question is, if you were watching this, whether it was the box score, listening on the radio, or watching there, watching me implode on the mound in real life, you'd say, what happened? How did that happen? This was a Tuesday game, the fourth inning of game maybe 40 of a 140 game season. 
So we're gonna investigate that today, and I'm gonna introduce you maybe to the term of the black swan. So if you've never heard the term, it's a negotiation term. And a great way to illustrate this is imagine you are, it's 1900 and you own a farm, and your farm has been appraised at $100,000. One day you get a knock on the door and a businessman says, I'll give you a million dollars for your farm. Great news, right? Fantastic news. You're ecstatic, your life's gonna change forever. But you might rightly ask, why would this man offer me 10 times more than my farm is worth? Well, this guy has found oil on your land, and he knows your land, your farm, is worth $30 million to him. That is the black swan. If you, as the homeowner, figured that out, you could probably negotiate 10, 15, 20 million dollars, right? So the black swan is that piece of contextual evidence that, if uncovered, could change everything. And there is a black swan to my story, which we're gonna investigate. So, I've had Tommy John surgery twice. I was a walk-on in college, I didn't get a scholarship, and I had to fight my way through independent baseball to hopefully one day get a chance with the major league organization. I never did. But in 2013, I made my, uh, I made my, or I got my second surgery. In 2014, I made my comeback. I had an average season. In 2015, I had an all-star season with Camden. The next year, I broke up my own trade to Long Island, and all I basically had to do was have a similar season to last year, basically just do what I was capable of doing to hopefully get the shot with the major league team and kind of be plucked out and thrown in AAA, just like Rich Hill was a couple years ago. So basically everything that I had done in my entire life was riding on this 2016 season. I had been slowly coming back from surgeries, coming back from adversity, and in 2016 it was my year just to do what I had slowly accumulated the ability of doing and get my chance. So, there was a fateful night. I had been pitching poorly. Um, on opening day of 2016, I had a lot of shoulder pain. I reached for my cell phone and a dagger of pain shot down my arm. I pitched like that for the rest of the season. And then one night as my ERA started to climb, I came into a game and made another mess like I had been doing. I came in, gave up three singles and got pulled. So I left the bases loaded with no one out. My teammate came in, a left-hander, who had bailed me out a number of times. He was honestly my hero that season. But he came in to bail me out yet again. He fell behind this time, 0-1, or 1-0, threw another ball, fell behind 2-0. And I remember sitting in the dugout, exasperated, as I watched his 2-0 fastball cruise in. It was met with a thunderclap. The ball rockets up into the black sky, becomes a golf ball, then an aspirin, finally peaking and crashing down into the scoreboard. So with that grand slam, I, I actually honestly laughed a little bit. It was a, a fitting exclamation point onto the end of my time with the Long Island Ducks. I knew at that moment I was gonna get released. I'd pitched so poorly, I was trending very much the wrong way, that as that ball collided with the scoreboard and all my runs cashed and we lost another game, uh, I was done. So that night, I went home to my garden level apartment that I shared with my girlfriend who was from Long Island. And I sat down at her bed, you know, with the navy blue moonlight pouring in, and she wriggled awake and asked me how the game went. I said, not well. And I sat there in silence for a minute before finally getting the courage to tell her what I'd never wanted to say. Because as ball players, I think one of the reasons we run into mental health issues is because we try, to, we try to ignore some of the things that are going on. We don't want to talk about them because we're afraid of giving them power. I didn't want to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. I didn't want to give power to the words that I told her. But ultimately, I knew and I told her, I'm going to get released. I don't know what this means for our relationship. It probably means that we're going to be over at some point. But I just need to tell you, it's gotten to the point where it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's just going to happen. My time here is done. Probably tomorrow when I go in, I'll have to clean out my locker. But I was wrong. And it was like Friday night or Saturday, and we had a road trip for seven days starting on Monday. So on Monday, I got on the bus with the team, and you know you're safe for that, that road trip. Yet, uh, I knew that at the end of that trip, I'd be getting released as soon as we got back. I'm sure they were taking calls, looking for someone to replace me. Yet, I pitched. I didn't think I'd pitch, but they pitched me. And here I was, pitching like a dead man. I had, no, I had no expectations. I had no fear of consequences. I was already getting released. I knew it. It was a certainty. So when I went out there, 
to start that fourth inning with the bases loaded, I pitched free. I punched out the first two hitters because that's what I knew how to do. I didn't have all these consequences and the weight of fear of failure and pressure on my shoulders for the first time in a while because I already knew that I was pitching as a dead man. But then I struck out the first hitter. And then I struck out the second hitter. And what happened was I had this big realization. I said, the old me showed up. And if I just punch out this next hitter, the ducks won't release me. The scouts will start to come back and will start to come back and watch me. And maybe I can have my old life back. The 30 years of baseball that I've been building towards this moment, this season that I ruined for myself, if I get this one last strikeout, I can have it all back. And so because of that, I didn't subconsciously want the batter to hit the ball. And it's astonishing that a human being throwing towards the most center location, which is the strike zone, can somehow miss as if hitting the window frame rather than throwing the ball through the window. I had this remarkable ability just to completely miss the strike zone. Because deep down I knew that if he hit the ball and something bad happened, I lost everything that I'd worked for my whole life. This was what I was, I was working towards. And because I made that second mess that day, I did. I lost it all. I was released that Sunday, and the last outing of my career was a couple days later. So what we have to ask ourselves is when we're distilling the game down into objective numbers and measurements and lots of stuff, we're all often going to find ourselves in a position where there's something that we can't figure out. Why did he implode that day? This guy came in and punched out two hitters. He was lights out and then just destroyed himself. A lot of times that extra thing that we're not privy to is the stuff between our ears. And even though there's mental skills coaches and there's a lot of great developments in baseball now, there's still, I think we have a long way to go in allowing players to talk about how they're feeling, to talk about uh, their performance and to find ways to shed some of these, these fears and consequences that we carry on our shoulders every single day when we're out there on the mound. So for me, that day, it's still, I denied that this thing happened. I tried to blame it on my shoulder. I have never told anyone this story until right now. It's not in my book, it's not anywhere else. Because I was so angry and embarrassed as a 30 year old who was not mentally weak that that happened. But even the best of us, whether it's a one walk, one walk in the World Series or a 3-1 count that we walk in a run or a hitter just completely chokes in a situation, there's lots of different ways for this to manifest itself. And so as you go out and you're analyzing, you're scouting, you're coaching, make sure you're looking for something that might be unseen because chances are there might be something mental going on. Maybe it's a problem at home, maybe it's a relationship issue, maybe it's uh, an anxiety that's been building over the fear of failure and consequences, but often if you search deep enough, you'll find some sort of mental thing, and that might be the black swan. Thank you.